All right. As I said, finishing it up, chapter 14. Um, I know these last chapters are like super short. Um, so I'm going to have like a, a page of text. Uh, but this is the, the book for Minnesota Geography. So. Um, but I'll do more updating of info and stuff when we do our other two books that we're going to be reading for this class, uh, which will be after we're finished with this one. Uh, small books, uh, The Late Homecomer and The Grace of Silence. If you haven't grabbed those, uh, they should be in the library or if you get them online, of course. Um, see, now I said I wouldn't record until I was doing the lecture and here I am talking about books and stuff. All right. Um, well, let's see. Minnesota, in a nutshell, continues to be a state of immigration, of immigrants coming in, and uh, of the population's always kind of changing, um, of, of neighborhoods changing over through time and whatnot. Uh, you know, a lot of this data in this book, they, they stop at the year 2000, even though this was published uh, like 10 years after that. Um, but when the census happens, it usually takes like a good few years before they actually publish all the data and stuff. So even stuff for the 2020 census, which you would think in your mind that should be all available and people should be able to make maps and stuff. And it's like, there's still a lot of it that is still just not quite out yet. But like I said, I'll try to update some of that stuff uh, next time. Um, well, similar to how uh, you know, Minnesota got its economic start with a lot of that milling and uh, a lot of that money stayed in the central cities, a lot of that tech stayed in the central cities, um, and it led to, there's a number of different kind of clusters of e economies that we have locally. Our book talks about uh, medical devices section uh, of our economy that um, evolved from, from milling technology as, as disparate as that sounds. Uh, Part of the reason that doesn't make, make sense maybe in your head is because there was actually, there was a time frame that Minnesota had a cluster of mainframe computing. Uh, mainframe computing, back when that was a thing, when you'd have computers that were the size of a room. Uh, Minnesota was the leader in that, but then when they went smaller than that, well, we switched over to medical devices and using some of that same tech uh, to limit those problems. Um, <clears throat> Uh, obviously, well, lumber, uh, lumber milling, flour production, these things uh, gone down through time. Similar to, to kind of the rest of the world, uh, small town decline, rural populations, the uh, economy uh, isn't great, so people are moving to central cities. Um, moving to central cities, but again, there there has been sprawl. Uh, I think I talked about that quite a bit when I was talking about transportation and whatnot. Um, you can see examples of, of how the highways, uh, well, they were put in place because sprawl was happening and then they further kind of encouraged sprawl. Uh, a number of the highways, well, we got a picture of the hub and spoke, yeah. Um, you could tell how kind of powerful the suburbs started to get by the fact that the highways uh, sometimes don't even go to the center, right? They just go around because for many people, it's more important they will live and work and shop in the suburbs. And so, whereas before the roads all went through downtown and if you're gonna go to the other side of the cities, uh, you would do a visit through downtown. Uh, these days, we have a whole big bypasses uh, and there was actually a number of, of different areas within the central cities that highways were going to be put through, but there were local protests that stopped it because when you put, well, highways through the center of a city, usually there's like a city there uh, and people living in shops and communities. Uh, and uh, a lot of these highways, when they went through the central cities, uh, they bulldozed properties that the city and state defined as kind of like the lowest value, which just meant the poorest areas. Uh, and so those places were just, were bulldozed, especially uh, a number of local African American communities were, were bulldozed through some Hispanic communities. Uh, they had to kind of re, 
relocate and move around, uh, but that's one of the reasons why uh, there's actually, as all the populations have been moving to the suburbs, uh, local African Americans have also uh, largely Brooklyn Center, Brooklyn Heights, uh, no, not Brooklyn Heights, Brooklyn Center, Brooklyn Park, uh, that kind of area. Uh, uh, as I said, when we did the transition from rail uh, to cars, uh, our, our society kind of became very car focused. All of a sudden, cars are everything, you know? Drive and movie. Anyone get to see it? Drive in movie before they the last many one many times many times it looks like the Valley High is maybe not going to be showing movies anymore uh, is there one still in Cottage Grove maybe uh, they used to be all over uh, and actually they used to be in the central cities uh, quite a bit more there was one down in Columbia Heights for many years uh, but they they bulldozed it and put in uh, Medtronic headquarters there uh, which again is local medical. Uh, devices industry. Uh, so, the old drive in theaters. Uh, yeah, sad to see, sad to see them go. Um, but that's also why, uh, you know, like uh, e even things like hotels switch to motels, which is just short for motor hotel. Uh, everything was about driving. Um, I think I showed you guys, this is mentioned a little bit before. Did I talk about? Did I show you guys this picture before? Is this at all familiar? Do you know what where what this is? Is it a mall? Yeah. Is that Harmony? No, this is uh, Southdale. Southdale. That's the first mall, right? Yeah. Uh, it was uh, well, concept of an enclosed climate-controlled mall, uh, unique to to Minnesota history and heritage here, as odd as that may sound, but it makes sense because it's really terrible outside in the middle of winter and if there's going to be any state that's going to make a big mall. Uh, although technically in, in all of North America, uh, there is a larger mall in Calgary uh, in Canada that has even worse uh, temperature, weather, winter than we do, so it's also understandable. Um, but yeah, it's something that we you know, you tell us pictures from, from years ago. Uh, Southdale's looking a bit different these days. Uh, but a lot of the old malls, uh, there was a, a, a mall that was called Apache Mall that was also one of the first enclosed malls, but that one was bulldozed. Um, a number of malls, they're, they're debating about what to do with them because a lot of them are just not doing that well, especially if everyone's going to the Mall of America. Well, then you're not going to the other malls, right? And if you go to, well, a mall that just isn't quite as, as comfortable and, and fancy. Uh, one of the main things that they're doing uh, in other places to bring back malls is, well, you know how like malls, usually you have your four quadrants that'll have your big box things that are there, you know? Uh, well, since those are going out of business, they're thinking about, in other states they've done this already, replacing those with residential. Uh, and so then, you know, you could have a nice, like, retirement community that lives there, and they can get their exercise walking around the mall, and they could, you know, if you also put in the mall uh, things like groceries, things that, that people would, would go to, well, who knows, they may also buy some other stuff while they're there, but that's kind of the, the thought for, uh, for replacing. Um, again, just uh, showing you examples of how uh, we came very auto-centric, right? Everything is about cars. Uh, you guys could probably guess what this is an early version of. It's McDonald's. Yeah, right? Again, drive-through, which was revolutionary at the time. What crazy, you're just gonna drive up and get your food? <clears throat> so when the Mall of America went in, uh, they had in mind of making it a new kind of regional downtown. Remember when I talked about how downtown is where all the shopping was and where kind of like everything happened? Uh, their goal was to have that be the, the new center uh, because if nothing else, uh, they have a lot more parking than downtown uh, or cheaper, I guess I should say. Uh, although it may surprise you to know that our central cities, uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul, actually have relatively cheap parking compared to most cities of its size. Uh, of its size. 
Uh, well, in the Mall of America, it also, uh, they had in mind, uh, Burnsville and Bloomington both hoped that this would encourage other businesses to locate there. Uh, and it has, there's like a lot of people are working in, uh, it, it has been successful as far as that goes. Although honestly, when it went in, you guys are probably too young to remember the news stories about it. There's lots of kind of doom and gloom and that it was gonna be just like a big failed project and a big waste of time and space. <clears throat> Actually, I'm gonna switch to, I have a different specific Mall of America lecture. I think I should go through. Um, so when the Mall of America was put in, I know this isn't the Mall of America, this is a downtown little residential development, uh, but it's using what's called neo-traditionalism. Uh, this isn't a term from your book or anything, so you don't have to like take notes on the term neo-traditionalism. Uh, but there was a big effort at the time uh, to do things like, well, neo-traditionalism, uh, a thing they try to focus on is local plants, for example, uh, local varieties of plants, more kind of natural surroundings, uh, and also buildings and whatnot that have more of a historical connection to a local place. Um, and I know the modern Mall of America, you probably don't get a big sense of that yet. Uh, these days, I, I would say. Do people remember when it was Camp Snoopy? Yeah. People do remember, okay. Um, well, that was a whole different kind of design aesthetic. Uh, these days, it's, it's very kind of like shiny and kind of uh, cartoonish coloring. Uh, but back in the day when it was Camp Snoopy, uh, well, when, when the Mall of America was put in, very specifically the de design aspects wanted it to feel like it was small town Minnesota. And the hope was that international tourists would come here and feel like they've really visited this state specifically, as well as just shopped. Because the, the mindset was that like you could just shop anywhere, let's make this an experience. Right? Let's make this a place you want to hang out. Because if you're going to hang out all day, you'll spend more money than if you don't hang out all day. Right? Um, again, I'm contrasting older and newer pictures just to kind of show you how it's changed through time. Uh, now, it has less of that small town look. It's going for more kind of like a shiny, I would say more of a, what's called an international style, uh, which just means kind of like bright and straight lines uh, and a, a lot of the the buildings from the original camp snoopy kind of look and feel are still in place uh but uh, they just kind of well they, they look a little a little like they're out of place a bit um the buildings and whatnot were supposed to like i said give you a small town f feel and vibe because obviously these buildings don't need roofs because there's not gonna be a drop of rain in here, right? It's just for aesthetics. It's just uh, to have you feel like, uh, you know, you're in downtown Stillwater or something, shopping, except for, you know, it never rains. Uh, and the, the weather's always perfect. Um, and they had these brick facades and wood. Uh, and then now what they've done now is they just kind of have painted over them uh, in, in this kind of like, almost glow in the dark color scheme. Uh, a lot of this is still there. A lot of this is still there. Uh, have people ever been walking out and they've, they've seen this chair and sign? Is this familiar at all? Maybe not. Some kind of depends on how much you look around. Um, for many years, uh, I've actually done this lecture about Mall of America for many years, for many classes. Uh, and for many years, there was just a chair on the wall with no identifying feature whatsoever. Uh, and so I'd always say to students, if any of you work at the mall, put up a sign or something. And then later on, coincidence? <laughs> Who knows? Uh, but this, do people know, even though there's a sign here and it says, Harmon Killebrew, uh, thank you for the memories. Do people know what this chair, the story about this chair that's on the wall? I don't know the story about the chair, but I know there's like a placard in Mall of America talking about the first base, so I think it has something to do with baseball. 
Yeah. Do people know what was at the Mall of America before it was the Mall of America? Met Stadium. Met Stadium. Uh, which was uh, a great big outdoor stadium, uh, but it was in a time that we had the, the Humphrey Metro Dome and, and indoor games and things were more of the rage. These things have their ups and downs because of course, uh, well, they bulldozed this outdoor stadium and now we have other outdoor stadiums that kind of have taken their place in different places. Uh, so it's like the fashion trends of stadiums can be fickle, I suppose. But this chair was in the stadium, and it was where a home run ball hit uh, in the audience. And you may say to yourself, well, what's the point of, of doing that? Well, the, the Met Stadium meant a lot to Minnesotans, uh, even though it was bulldozed. Uh, like, you can find whole websites where people are talking about it, because it, it was the only big stadium in the state. So people saw the Beatles or the Rolling Stones, or like cars racing, like anything that needed a big stadium was at that one specific place. I think I got pictures somewhere. Oh, and this is the little little placard that they put up so that you know what that chair is there for. And the, the home plate is made out of like brass on the other side as well, um, because it's a, I think it's like technically like the longest home run ever hit at the stadium. You're ahead of me here. You're way ahead of me. You probably, maybe you haven't noticed that if you're walking around Camp Snoopy, there are these things that are on the ground. These are meant to be memorials uh, because a lot of people in the area, uh, they didn't want the stadium to go away. Like they wanted it to last forever. Uh, this is what it looked like, right? Not that different from other uh, outdoor stadiums that, that are getting audience these days. But like I said, it was the time of the, uh, the Humphrey Metro Dome, and so it was just seen that the future was indoors. Uh, the other thing you might not have noticed, well, maybe when you're, when you're at Camp Snoopy, uh, before they changed, because this is the same building, they just put a, a shiny coat of paint on it. But when it was Camp Snoopy, uh, all the different rides were supposed to be representative of different historical occupations in Minnesota, right? That sounds kind of complex. It's like, am I going to a museum or am I going to a roller coaster? Well, both. <laughs> right? Uh, and they would bring in things from I don't know where, like old saws and stuff. And, you know, as, as you know from this class, well, that is a big part of our local history. Uh, this is that the blue building there, right? They, they've just changed it over. They've taken out the old saws and things. And uh, there also used to be, you might not have noticed, but there used to be kind of sprawled about randomly parts of old sawmills. Uh, I don't know if you could actually see the saw in this one, uh, but they would put this around. Um, oh, and also it was supposed to be all uh, Minnesota vegetation as well. Like I said, it was supposed to be all around a Minnesota experience. Uh, they're switching now to, when I say now, for years now, uh, they're switching to tropical plants instead. Tropical plants you could usually identify because they're extra shiny and they're, they're extra waxy because they have so much rain. They, they, that has the rain kind of bounce off them a bit. Uh, but tropical plants, actually do better indoors because uh, tropical plants they're used to being underneath a very thick canopy of, of trees and not getting direct sunlight uh, and so if you're gonna have a plant in the mall uh, tropical is actually surprisingly better the Minnesota varieties actually they did okay but they didn't do great there weren't they're not uh, meant to be in climate controlled all year same temperature no direct sunlight, right? That's not how they're they're meant to be. Oh, well, this is like I said, an old sawmill that was just like just out in the mall among the greenery and stuff. Now uh, space is at too much of a premium, and there's no kind of just extra spaces for them to have what is kind of garbage, you know. <clears throat> so log shoot ride again supposed to be connected to our history of, of the lumber industry. Uh, this is inside, uh, and just my friend showing me around. 
Uh, this used to be also in this little pond area. Again, a representation of the agricultural past of Minnesota. Now it's been replaced with the little SpongeBob and where the, where the little mannequin was, they just put a plant there. Uh, more rides, again, connected to, it's supposed to be specific Minnesota history, right? It's supposed to be connected to the mining industry. Although, like I said, I don't think anyone going on these rides connected any of them to specific Minnesota history. Uh, this is what the area looks like now. Uh, again, some more older photos. And this is, again, representative of... Well, we have, of course, classic red barns kind of all over the rural areas of the state, and so they made a little representation of that. You could do your old-timey photos, and then stuff that just kind of looked like garbage, you know? And they brought in leaves and stuff to make it feel like, you're, you know, obviously those leaves didn't fall from any of the trees in there. They had an old time photos place, and I was never there. They did indeed. There is an old time photos elsewhere in the mall now. There is, yeah, yeah I have them there. That's very nice, very fun. Um, you know, again, a pick and TNT, right? Like when we were looking at the mining history of the states, like, well, that stuff that was that was used a lot. Uh, yes. I don't, I don't know if we necessarily would want to have something that's labeled TNT in the center of a mall these days. <laughs> well, <laughs> you were going to ask Tom? I was going to say. There's Spongebob on the TV and the business to call that foreshadowing. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Very true. Um, yeah, Spongebob took over everything. Uh, this is what that area kind of looks like now. Right? Very different. Uh, this is right by the, the mine ride. Uh, you know, some old equipment from mines. And I don't know, some chair that they got out of a junkyard, maybe? I don't know. Uh, add to the aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, right? Like an old, old a wheel here um, and again like I said it, well it's supposed to give you a feel like you're in a rural area of Minnesota uh, this is what the area looks like now Unfortunately. like I said very different aesthetic right uh, old picture and that house? Yeah. it kind of looks like it uh, so now again shiny bright colors uh, this you know and obviously you know, this is a permanent thing. It's never going to roll anywhere. But again, everything is just to give you a feeling like you're just strolling and you've just come about, came across this in a small town in Minnesota somewhere. Um, and then everything was also, obviously this was painted to look old, right? And that's how everything was. Everything was, it was created to look like it was old. And again, like you're in, in a rural area of Minnesota. Um, not to be confused with, I just looked up some random history photos of, of people who worked in the industries being represented. Lumber, agriculture. Uh, and as they've gone through this kind of transformation to, to tropical varieties, uh, uh, it's been kind of a slow process. Like I said, you could still see some of the elder trees here and there, and of course the buildings uh, many of them still have this older aesthetic. Um, some of the areas where right, things just don't seem to, to line up. In, in geography, we actually talk about how space and place, uh, we see manifestations of kind of like struggle between identities and Im images and stuff. Uh, and so that's, Mall of America is just a real great classic example of this. This is what that area used to look like, right? And again, this is like a, a specific appeal, a general store, right? Like it's a small town general store uh, that maybe maybe people are visiting, they saw a little house in the prairie or something and they're thinking they're gonna get a connection to this. Uh, again, this like like log cabin look. I know you got Woodstock up there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Back when it was Camp Snoopy. A uh, little, this is actually a shooting gallery that used to be in there. Oh, you can't. Some of these are out of the lighting is not the best. Right. See it a little oh, better. Wow. But again, you know, it's supposed to look like it's fall leaves and stuff, and uh, that area helped prevent forest fires. Mm -hmm. Boy, the lighting is just so much better. Look at my lights. The lights dim like this. All right. Oh, but now I can't see the keys. <laughs> 
bring in everything else that'll be the same. Just backtracking a little bit. I'm trying to remember if anything else was really dark. Nah, it's all pretty well lit. Alright. Let your eyes adjust. This is what's in that little shooting gallery area now. Little bumper cars. Very different aesthetic, right? Uh, and of course, the irony of the Mall of America doing that, doing a small town aesthetic, is we do actually have many small towns uh, that would love to have tourists and love to have people come by and shop in their little shops. Uh, and they're just kind of all rotting into the ground, right? Uh, story of rural, rural decline and urban growth in the Twin Cities, and it's the, the same, same all over the U.S., and it's actually happening all, all over the world. Uh, this is some far, far north, again, the classic red barn that we have somewhere, some places. Uh, you know, you probably have driven around in rural areas and seen like random farming equipment, you know, and it's just like, it's old farming equipment that isn't used anymore, but people kind of almost want to have tributes and put them up on a hill or something, rather than just have them changed over. Um, yeah, homemade fudge. This is again a, in the Mall of America, uh, and we know this isn't made in any home, right? It's like, like you're in the mall, uh, but they're they're trying to fool us. Uh, but I would say also. When the Mall of America first went in, there was a huge uh, design aesthetic of buying things that had been pre-aged, pre-aged. I don't know if that's still a big thing, but try to notice that when you're doing your holiday shopping. Um, some would say it's because, you know, we encourage a bit of a throwaway society and culture. We buy things and in order to keep on buying lots of things, you gotta throw things away because you can't just buy things and then buy more things. Uh, so we don't have things that are being handed down through generations. Instead, we'll buy them looking like they're aged, but that they're made modern day in China, right? I might be a, I might be a little stupid, but what's a water closet? Oh, water closet? Anyone be able to answer that question? It's the bathroom. Oh, yeah. wow. <laughs> it's a polite way of saying, you know. You'll still see signs that say WC on them for bathrooms. Yeah. But it'd just be the closet that has some running water. Yeah. Uh, and again, like I said, these these things harken back to old times, uh, right? Oh. You could buy grandma and apple pie on sale at the Mall of America. Um, lots of stores also that were uh, very popular. I don't know if these are still popular, but you buy all these things that look like they've been aged and that you've bought them from rural areas, but they're just made made modern day, uh, usually in China. Uh, and this is the new aesthetic. And again, even if it's nostalgic, this one is for the 50s, everything still has this glitzy, shiny look to it now compared to the original aesthetic when the Mall of America was put in. All right, back to the regular. Um, so the mall got uh, a couple, well, a number of good businesses to, to invest. Um, and the, the city council actually required uh, to approve of the mall, they required those specific memorials to the Met Stadium and to other things. Because it was felt that it would <laughs> ease people through the, the loss of that stadium. Uh, but also, realistically, uh, it made for lots of uh, historical events there that were just cash grabs. So you would have some of the people who were, were sports heroes who will go to the mall and you go and sign their autograph and maybe buy some things. And so I was really trying to just connect to that market. <clears throat> um, this chapter also talks somewhat about the Metropolitan Council. Uh, People know what the Metro Metropolitan Council is? Well, um, people know what urban planning is. Urban planning. Uh, lots of, well, when we, when we talk about urban planning, there's what's called organic planning. 
Organic planning is how most cities have been planned throughout history, and what that means is that there's no plan. People buy property and do what they want to it, and the roads are just the spaces left over in between things. That's all the roads were, right? Just spaces in between things. Uh, well, now that we have an interstate highway system and we have very long range planning of developments and whatnot, uh, a number of different urban regions have decided to have large planning entities that make the decisions basically about density, where developments are gonna go, if they're gonna be approved or not, what kind of rules there should be. Uh, the Twin Cities is one of those places, and we have the Metropolitan Council, which looks at the whole state, but most specifically the urban area, suburban uh, area, central. Um, a number of other states do too, like uh, Oregon. Oregon yeah. uh, Portland, specifically, has really good planning. Uh, and so Minnesota, um, this is one of the reasons why it does things like, uh, I don't know if you've ever noticed that, that it's only recently there's very tall buildings kind of going up in the uptown area. Uh, they had rules against that. They had rules against that. Uh, there used to be all kinds of rules about the height of buildings. Like uh, downtown Minneapolis, you might have seen like there's three buildings that are very similar heights. Uh, well, the first of them, the, the IDS building, uh, which is the glass looking one, they were the tallest at the time. Uh, and they also made the city agree that they would be the tallest building for at least 50 years. Uh, building next to it, which I think is a bank building, but it has like a big halo thing on top. You guys have seen that? Uh, technically that building is slightly higher, slightly taller because of that little halo thing that was able to get past the rules. So what, uh, what the, the IDS building did was they, they, at their base, they dug out some of the dirt so that it would technically be taller if you measure from the top all the way to the bottom of the building. Uh, little things like that, right, are, are pretty comical, but uh, happen all the time in cities. Uh, what time we got? We got time for some small questions, small group questions. I think that's... Let me make sure I got this whole topic. Is there one more slide for this topic, for this chapter? Well, before we leave off the chapter, I will say a couple of the other topics, and then we'll do some questions, uh, that are wrapping up in this chapter. Light rail is discussed, uh, but very little, because at the time, there wasn't a lot of it going on. Have people ever taken a light rail anywhere? I saw my first light rail like about a week ago. You saw it the first time, right? Um, you know, for some people it's convenient. I live, people know where Frogtown is? Kind of. Uh, kinda. uh over in St. Paul, uh, just off of university. Uh, so I, for example, I, I, I went and saw Lizzo the other week, uh, and just jumped on the light rail and took it downtown St. Paul. Um, and then I did, I walked home actually, cause it was quicker. Uh, well, the light rail has been very controversial because of course, as you all remember, we had rail all over, right? We had rail coming all the way out here to the suburbs, and that's how the suburbs, including this one, got their shape and form. Uh, light rail going in now uh, is expensive. Uh, people are unsure how much of it will be used or not used, but you could take light rail to the Mall of America, for example, like that was one of the first stops that was put in to take it to the airport. Uh, relatively convenient. Um, chapter also talks about gentrification. I forget if we talked about gentrification before. Maybe not. People have heard that term before? Anyone, anyone off, able to offer up an attempt at a defini definition of gentrification? Basically meaning uh, either higher tax bracket residents or moving in businesses into a historically low income area. Yeah, and it's a double-edged sword because you could have an area that is kind of like declining economically, right? Um, well, if a pl area is declining economically, things like crime will go up, you know, and like just things like littering, 
Um, I think uh, it's called broken window syndrome, where if there's like a building that's that's not used much, someone throws a rock and breaks one of the windows. As soon as one of the windows is broken, then all of a sudden, everyone, every kid who walks by wants to break a window, and then then you have a big mess, right? Uh, so places want to get around that, um, and sometimes people will move into uh, poor areas in an attempt to kind of like help fix it up, and they'll fix up their house, right? Or if they have a, buy a little business, they'll fix it up and make it cute. Um, which, it, which is, like I said, it's a double-edged sword because it also will raise uh, the property values in the area. And so then the poor people who live in that area that like you're hoping to benefit, their rents go up and they may have to, they may be displaced. And so the very people that you're hoping to like help have to move elsewhere, right? Which is not the thing people usually want to do when they're trying to, although honestly, a lot of people, a lot of gentrification is just for people wanting to make money, right? Like uptown used to be kind of working class, um, but uh, wealthy people moving in and fixing it up and whatnot, and all of a sudden it's the hip, cool place I would say what often happens, the gentrification process, often there's a classic uh, cycle where an area is getting run down, a little dilapidated. Um, often artists will move in, because uh, often artists don't have a ton of money, and they'll just do some artsy things, maybe start a coffee shop, and it will still be like low income and, and cheap and stuff, but it becomes cool, it becomes hip. And then people want to move there and whatnot, and again, pushes up the rents, and then all of a sudden you have all the artsy people who can't afford to live in Uptown anymore, right? Like I said, this is kind of a classic example in the cycle that happens, and there's different things people have tried to do to try to bypass that. Like for example, there's often, um, like downtown St. Paul has artist lofts, where if you're an established artist, uh, you get cheap rent and you can live central uh, and they will do art shows in the buildings and stuff like that, right? Um, sometimes they'll do that to try to fight the displacement of those populations that, that kind of made a, an area cool. Um, let's see, oh, the other thing this chapter talked about is, I, I don't know if you guys can tell, probably, I'm not into sports a lot myself, but there's a heck of a lot more sports and stadiums in, in the cities these days. You know, for a time, it was the Metropolitan Stadium and that was it. And then it was like the Humphrey Dome and that was like mostly it. But now there's a bunch of stuff. Um, and the cities have hoped that, that would bring money back to the cities and people. And I would say it's a mixed bag uh, because those stadiums very often take large amounts of investment of public funds, like your tax money goes into building those. Uh, and does it ever bring that money back? A lot of people who go to sports stadiums and stuff, they often don't stick around and spend money, which is kind of like the hope, you know, that people will just want to go to all the places that have had such a great time. They'll go to a bar, swing by a gift shop or something. But very often people, as soon as the event is over, they're out of there, right? They're like, not hanging out. Uh, so that's a real mixed bag as far as success or not success of that. Um, the other thing this chapter talked a bit about was, uh, well, downtown Minneapolis uh, has had a changeover through time. You can see the retail core here along Nicollet Mall. Like I said before, it used to be where all the shopping was, but a lot of the shopping's gone out of business. Like Dayton's used to be a gigantic store uh, that was downtown. Uh, and you would have, they would have these, these uh, annual big Christmas display things that people would go to. I don't know how many years those have been gone now, but. Um, So the process of downtown Minneapolis being a place where people went to shop and then people stopped going there to shop. So the downtown for like a number of decades was pretty dead, was pretty not much happening. Um, a, lot of, a lot of local theorists were pushing for a long time that what, what needed to happen to the downtowns to bring life back was to put housing for people. 
right? It's like, well, if you have people living there, then they'll do stuff there. But if you want to require everyone to drive in from, from their suburb to come in and shop or whatever, it's like, you're just not going to get it. Uh, so that's part of the reason why, uh, well, we had too much commercial buildings, too much commercial buildings. Because the old philosophy was, well, if you build commercial buildings, well, then great big commercial uh, businesses will all just locate their headquarters here. And it's like, well, we got some headquarters like Target, but mostly like that's not, we don't, people, they could just build a new office park in a suburb that's brand new rather than come to some area of downtown. Uh, so that was the old philosophy and it really failed. And like I said, there was a good like couple decades that the central cities were pretty kind of empty and getting run down. Cause that sort of thing too, is the tax base had moved to the suburbs. And so people paying taxes for just the upkeep of garbage and stuff, that money went away. Uh, but it has come back with residential. Now one of the ironies of teaching this class in the year 2022 is of course we had downtowns kind of die again because uh, nobody went anywhere for a while, right? Especially into downtowns, into big events with a whole bunch of people. There are a lot of people who still aren't going to big events, right? So downtowns are really struggling right now. Uh, and I, I'm feeling that like maybe next spring things will change over enough. Uh, we'll see. But that's the thing is that, that downtowns are having the same argument now that they had 20 years ago of trying to bring life back. And it's like, what do we got to do to get people doing things in the central city? And that's the answer to that. We don't, we don't quite know yet. All right. Did anyone go to the Metrodome before? A couple of people. All right. Um, yeah, Metrodome. All right. All right, well, as I threatened previously, going to have you all work in some small groups, but I didn't bring my deck of cards. So can you self-select, self-select in groups of like four to six people per group? Self-select, move around, find someone who looks smart. Hope they'll be in your group. Yeah, there you go. If you're off an island, find some people. If you're off by yourself, it's really all. Oh, for a while. Yeah. I mean, you said that.